Well, I'm going to speak about um, um, what's happening in the Scottish Government because I've worked with survivors in the Survivor Agency in Scotland um, in, in, in Fife and, um, uh, and the support and counselling and care is absolutely um, critical but we need to look at how we can change things at a strategic government um, level. I also want to say something about gender equality. Um, no single gender has a precedence on pain and suffering. And men and women who have survived abuse have equality. Surely that's something that we have to remember. And in Scotland, it's not perfect. Um, I don't know what it's like down here, but we have been fortunate to have a very strong survivor movement where men have been embraced and supported and counselled within our agencies and some of my colleagues are up there today from Fife and um, so there's a lot of good stuff happening there but not enough which is why when I'll touch on the second part of my presentation we commissioned a scoping exercise for um, the for male services something's gone a bit rattly there I don't know it'll be my um, beads um, so this is this paper this document's here for you today um, it's, I, my presentation isn't complete because it literally just got published um, and was presented up in Dundee and Sue was there um, on Tuesday this week. So I, I took some extracts, general extracts, but I'm going to, there's plenty of copies here and you can download it. So Survivor Scotland, I'm not a government spokesperson, I want to say straight away, um, I'm, I, I'm not a civil servant. I've been asked to act as an advisor um, to a policy team in the government um, because of my experience of working with survivors, and that's a good thing. Survivor Scotland, we called it Survivor Scotland because the national strategy for survivors of childhood sexual abuse is absolutely what it's about, but we wanted it to be named something that was relevant for survivors, and we've managed to get our own website with this logo um, and not just a kind of government-faced um, um, uh, sort, of, sort of website. This is our kind of, if you like, our mission statement we want to very much dispel the myths that survivors are somehow somebody else. All of us, whether we realise it or not, will know somebody, and many of us are survivors ourselves. Clicky click. Oh. I'll just give you a brief history of the strategy. Um, it kind of came about when I was at CASP, Kingdom of Survivors Project. Scottish Parliament had just come into being at that time and I was down at a march and rally in London with a group of survivors and um, we'd, we'd been down there several years, you know, marching Hyde Park, demonstrations and speeches um, in um, Trafalgar Square and handing in petitions to number 10. People in this room know because we spoke about it, nothing ever happened, nothing came back. It was a very empowering experience to be there were survivors collectively, but nothing was coming back from government. So when we were coming back in the train, sort of saying, oh God, what, you know, survivors felt very deflated. And because of you know, my background in CND and Amnesty and others, I thought, right, well, here we've got maybe something that we might be able to do. Uh, we've got a Scottish Parliament. And as I heard about this petitions committee. So survivors asked me to put the petition in on their behalf. And that went in in 2001. And straight away from that, the, we managed to get interest from MSPs to set up another new group in the Scottish Parliament, which was called Cross-Party Working Groups. And I, was, I have to be honest, I mean, you know, I can be cynical uh, along with the, the next person, but I was actually um, surprised and heartened the amount of genuine response that I had to the, uh, to the petition and to the kind of things we were calling for. So that group came about and we had a big debate in the parliament and we started to kind of get ahead of steam. And the cross-party group gave survivors, allies like Sue and ourselves and others who have got an interest in working with survivors, a, an environment that gave us a kind of place to be and a place to lobby together and with a sense of some kind of good power um, and, and good connections. And it actually acted as a conduit to getting um, uh, what 
I'll describe in the strategy. Short life working group, very briefly, that's a kind of mechanism that came next. One of the health ministers, Malcolm Chisholm, as then, um, agreed when he came to one of our many events, because we always get the ministers in, because again, because of devolution, we managed to get, and this is not about nationalism, this is about devolution in Scotland, we managed to get contact, close contact with our decision makers very, very easily. And this Short Life Working Group report was commissioned, it ran for a year, and we came up with a series of recommendations of how the strategy might look like and what it would need to be because we kept saying there has to be a strategic response to the societal issue. It's a public health issue. It affects all of us whether we've been abused or not and we need to do something about it. And from that, again, five, five years on from the petition, we could never have believed it. We actually managed to get a national strategy a agreement across government, because it's across all the different portfolios. So justice, education, health, and um, communities all agreed okay. Because I was saying when we met with the, the ministers, this is not a new population. This is not all about new money, and our colleague, the psychiatrist this morning said that thing. It's, it's about actually, how can we kind of like provision services for survivors and make their lives better? Survivor Scotland um, were located within the Adult Care and Support Division of the Scottish Government, which is the Health um, and Social Care Directorate. It's a good place to be because it's about, you know, um, looking after adults who are vulnerable because there's obviously child protection, but the whole thing about, I mean, I always used to say, I work with yesterday's children. They're grown up today, but they were children of yesterday. Um, so that's where we are, and we consist of two policy staff, civil servants, and two professional advisors. I had three, Sarah, my colleague, has um, recently um, left, but myself and Sue Moody, who's got a legal background, are there, we're there part-time to help support the work of the... Um, ongoing work, just to run through briefly, um, Care Pathways, again, we, we saw in the, the films, you know, people are passed from pillar to post, um, as they go through the health and social care um, uh, sort of uh, kind of uh, sort of uh, avenues, so care pathways was something. Communication strategy. We conducted a um, a, a national um, sort of a survey amongst um, you know a great many stakeholders, and we ran sort of um, workshops all around the country. And what came out of that was there was two um, discrete um, audiences that we um, should really be targeting and. The priority audience came out as actually health and social care professionals. Um, it, it was felt that, yes, the general public need to know more about this, but the, 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 the health and social care professionals need to know more um, first. So that's still ongoing. I won't, I mean, you can go on our website, which is at the bottom, which is, and there's cards and booklets down in the, the bit where we had our tea and lunch. Um, all the information's there. Data collection, back to the thing earlier on, only 1% of, 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 of people's records has a history of whether or not they've been abused. Um, and uh, again, we have had real good support from a um, uh, consultant in public health and five, Dr. Margaret Hanna. Um, and she was saying, you know, we need to get data. So we conducted a, a pilot and Sarah and I, um, you know, um, helped in that. In Fife, in a, a gynaecological clinic for unexplained pelvic pain and training the, um, and Sue and Casp and other people who were involved in that, training the clinical and nursing and frontline staff um, on uh, this data collection um, and also in the Aberdeen foyer, which was young men and women, homeless mental health. And these are very interesting findings. Again, you can find the full outcome of that in the website, um, but it's going on because now people want to do it in gum clinics, that's a gender uh, uh, medicine sexual health, learning disability, and so on and so forth. So it's taking ahead of steam. It's again, it's about kind of getting something in and getting it to fly. Historical and care abuse time to be heard. We're looking after, you know, that issue. And that, again, uh, there's some reports downstairs and it's on the, um, the website. This is about Scotland perhaps looking to take on a similar, but not the full um, sort of um, amount of committees that there were in Ireland. This was a confidential committee pilot and it looks as if Scotland's going to go forward and run that across um, the whole of Scotland and it'll become national. National training programme, Sue's here. We're funding that. That's so important um, and it's important we play a part of that. Service Development Fund is um, a, 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 a sort of what, it's, is what it says. It's actually money from the Scottish Government, Survivor Scotland, 
to allocate to survivor, both in statutory and in voluntary sector agencies, and I'll come on to that in a wee bit, and the website, which I think is really good. Sarah and I wrote the content with help from, you know, obviously consultant survivors all along through the process. I keep doing that the wrong way. Ah, oh, there we are. Um, did I? Yeah. These are our priorities. The cross-party group, the petition, the work of the strategy is female and male, male and female. It's, it's sex abuse, but it's physical, psychological um, as well. And no one takes, occurs in isolation. So male survivors was very much one of the top of our agendas. And um, as is then prevention um, around working with young through um, agencies to actually target young people who are displaying sexually harmful behaviour. And there's a lot of really, really good work coming out of that funding stream. Prisons, survivors in prisons. Um, uh, again, you know, a, a huge, huge population of survivors in prisons. Rural services, and it's a shame that Julie's not going to be here because uh, uh, Julie and Darlene and from RAL are absolutely fantastic and we've been working with them for ages. I mean, places like that, Argyll and Butte, I mean, Scotland is, is very rural. Um, so these are just some of the, the, some of the agencies that have been funded um, through uh, the, to, to work specifically with male survivors. They've had pockets of money for other things as well. And these are the, you know, again, we're kind of like, kind of keep refining and developing the priority areas to make sure that we're getting into sort of, again, this whole field of, of, of describing the experience of childhood sexual abuse and its long-term effects as trauma, it's complex trauma. Um, learning disability, um, CASP, Marnay isn't here, um, who's a new manager, they're doing fantastic work at CASP and elsewhere. Male survivors still there, this is not in any kind of, um, you know, sort of like, a uh, kind of list of priority who's top, they're, they're all priority. Minority ethnic groups, fantastic new work happening there with Roshni who are leading on that and, and again you can see it all on the website. The physical health consequences, I mean we talk about the mental health consequences of survivors but we really, really, really need to get down to the physical health consequences um, of, of, of sexual assault in childhood and, and, its, and its consequences are and there's a lot of good evidence and, and research on that and again Sarah Nelson's been doing sterling work on that. Back to prevention in prisons I've mentioned and again we're keeping the rural services. So that's a kind of, I feel like a kind of bit of a whirlwind trip through um, uh, the national strategy. Um, so I'm just going to go on now to the sort of the, what I've been asked to do which is to kind of like talk about a scoping exercise. Um, again Sarah played a, an important part of this um, through her research and it tied in just so neatly with the communication strategy findings that we had got when we did the, the surveys and the, the roadshows and in any way do you know something we knew already <laughs> we knew um, that this had but we've had to have it you know black and white to show that, um, that the lack of parity for service for male survivors and the lack of awareness because I don't think anybody will disagree with me um, when I say that I believe the prevalence rates um, and male survivors is underreported, and I would suggest, and you know, um, that it 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 will be near enough equal. 